Red on 12 News. A Plymouth woman's story of heart-wrenching memories, why people are thanking her for her story. Plus, a long-awaited traffic plan that could provide a temporary solution to easing congestion on I-494. But first, trying to keep her home. How legislation introduced today could help a Golden Valley woman and others like her. 12 News starts right now. A Golden Valley woman's crusade to keep her home has sparked a statewide push for foreclosure reform. Despite having a job and the money to pay her mortgage, Rose McGee is facing eviction. Renee Bonneau joins us now with more on her case and how legislation could help her and others in a similar situation. Alex and Shannon, Rose McGee initially had trouble paying the mortgage when she was laid off more than a year ago. After getting another job, she was working with City Mortgage and Fannie Mae to modify her home to keep her home her loan to keep her home. However, at the same time, the lenders were putting her home through foreclosure. It's a process called dual tracking, and state lawmakers introduced a bill this week that would make dual tracking illegal in Minnesota. I want to see this particular bill pass so that people who don't even know yet that they're going to have to deal with something like this won't have to deal with something like this. The bill was chief authored by Representative Mike Freiberg, who lives just three blocks away from McGee in Golden Valley. He and fellow lawmakers joined McGee at the Capitol Wednesday morning to introduce the bill. Dual tracking is illegal in some states, and Freiberg says he thinks other states will soon come up with similar legislation. I think the foreclosure crisis really brought it kind of to the fore, and it's you know it's just taken a little while, but I think it's I think it's it's gaining traction um, as an issue from state to state. So I you know I expect more and more states will will prohibit the procedure. In addition to banning dual tracking, the bill includes other foreclosure reform provisions. It requires protections for military service members, mandatory mediation if a borrower requests it, and it would eliminate the phone call runaround. Shannon and Alex, that last item requires the lender to provide a single point of contact for a borrower at a lender. So it's some needed reform. Yes. Thanks a lot, Renee. Right. Thanks, Renee. Foreclosures are way down from a couple of years ago, and that has helped home prices to continue to creep up. Realtor groups expect prices to rise 8 to 12 percent this year. For some perspective, here's how several local suburbs fared. In Brooklyn Park, the average sales price jumped 15 percent in 2012 to $146,000. In New Hope, the average sales price rose 10 percent. And in Golden Valley, the average sales price climbed 9 percent. The Twin Cities region overall saw a 9 percent increase with prices rising to $211,000. Expanding I-494 with an additional third lane through Plymouth has long been a top priority for city officials. It is the only remaining two-lane stretch of the I-494 corridor from high 50, Highway 55 to the East Fish Lake Road overpass. Now MnDOT may have a temporary solution to ease congestion. Putting an end to rush hour bottlenecks and traffic snarls along 494 through Plymouth has long been the rallying cry for the addition of a third lane. We're seeing not just people's time wasted, you know, sitting on 494 in congestion, but also then coming out, spilling over onto our local roads, creating wear and tear on the roads that weren't built for that traffic. This week, Plymouth officials got word of a short-term solution from MnDOT. When traffic gets to a certain level out there in the existing two lanes, we would open the shoulder and allow people to drive back. Called a dynamic shoulder lane, MnDOT officials would widen the right shoulder of 494 to create an extra lane that would be open only during peak periods like rush hour. We would be able to implement that, that shoulder and that dynamic lane um, during those peak periods where it's truly congested out there. The $34 million short-term fix would be part of overall road maintenance and bridge work scheduled for 2014. I understand this is a short-term solution, so we would support and get behind it being a short-term solution. Long-term, MnDOT will now study the possibility of adding a third lane in the form of a MnPass lane, like on 394, that could run all along the corridor from Rogers to Bloomington. With an estimated 100,000 vehicles traveling the Plymouth stretch daily and that number steadily growing, Plymouth's mayor says she's just happy to see plans moving forward. We feel that the city and MnDOT can continue to partner and get this project done, hopefully within the next couple of years.
Going forward, the mayor said Plymouth doesn't necessarily oppose the addition of a min-pass lane as long as it runs the entire corridor. They are the images of strength and determination on display at the state capitol. Photographs honoring local Holocaust survivors are on display this week as Minnesota observes International Holocaust Remembrance Day. The portraits by local artist David Sherman focus on the living, and they include photographs of local survivors like Eva Gross of Plymouth. As a 16-year-old girl, Eva Gross had to leave her home in Hungary after being deported by the Nazis. And for the next year, Eva and her mother protected each other through stays in six different concentration camps. As Delane Cleveland reports, her story is one of perseverance through unimaginable conditions. But it's a tale she wants to share as Holocaust survivors become fewer in number. I personally want to thank you. Inside Eva Gross's your, Plymouth home, your story really touched my, my heart. Is a collection of letters from students across the Twin Cities. Thank you. Thanking her for sharing her story. They told me, I thank you so much for coming and we appreciate you, your story so much. Made, me, made us think that we are not as bad off as I think, I, I think we are. Eva's story so, begins in 1944. This is my aunt. When her and several other family members were deported from their small Hungarian town. The Hungarian the army gave us over to the Germans. For the next year, Eva and her mother suffered through Auschwitz and five other concentration camps. Hitler wanted to take all as many Hungarian Jews out of Hungary as possible. They had to endure forced labor. I was working on eight machines. They struggled with disease. She got fever and she didn't know, uh, you know, what was happening to her. Grappled and with near starvation. We have been given no water, no food. And persevered through death this. marches. And we kept on going for days and days. But in the end, and they survived because they had each death. other. If she, she will die, I don't want to live. Today, their photo is one of 35 in the state capitol rotunda as part of an exhibit featuring local Holocaust survivors. There. Story. Laura Zell so is one of the people behind the photo family. project. And I just hope that it, it serves as art should serve, that people come into the space, they reflect, they read, um, they absorb, they begin to understand the enormous history that the Holocaust is and was. We had enough. Eva is yeah, 85 had... now and admits but that but it won't be long before no there aren't any survivors left to share their experiences. That isn't enough information. Uh, information on it. And that's why she wants to share her story as well as preach an important message. Hate is, should be el eliminated from our vocabulary. Nobody is born with hate. Eva said she only began sharing her story about five years ago, but now she makes her way to local schools and colleges and even spoke at Tulane University in New Orleans. As for the photo project, the hope is that it will act as an educational tool that will make its way to different churches, synagogues, historical societies, and schools around the state. Alex and Shannon. Thank you, Delane. Important story there. Coming up, what started out as a hobby has led to a career. Now Sally McGraw is sharing style advice in a new book. Her story next. And later in sports, the Cooper boys basketball team aims to stay unbeaten in conference play. But first, it's your AccuWeather forecast. Here's some fashion food for thought. Learning to dress well has little to do with price and more to do with getting the look that you want. Today in our third installment of the Money Savers Book Club, we talk to author Sally McGraw, who is out with her first book titled Already Pretty. It's casual, but it's really fun. When we first met Sally McGraw, this is sort of a bib style necklace. In the summer of 2009, she was sharing style advice from her blog. We found this Tory Burch blouse. Through her website, alreadypretty.com, she shares advice for dressing well. There is a spectrum of style. There is not one right way to look good. There are plenty of, there's plenty of room on the style spectrum for all of us. People started depending on Sally's style advice in a big way. I don't feel like I'm one of those bloggers who became an overnight success. I've been doing it for a little over five years, um, and it definitely took pretty much that entire time to get to where I am now, and it's just been a gradual 
increase in traffic and increase in interest in what I've been doing. Now Sally has more than 8,000 followers and she shares advice in national publications. I launched the blog with the idea in mind that I would just do it as a hobby and have fun with it and it's definitely still fun um, but it's I never expected it to become my career at all. Sally became a book author last summer when her style book titled Already Pretty launched. I wanted to create a style guide that would allow women to choose where they wanted to be, define their own style, have some fun with it, express themselves instead of feeling like they have to confine themselves to a set of rules that someone else has made up. The book explains how to define and expand your style, featuring a remarkably diverse group of women. It's a great sort of self-guided makeover kit. Um, it's very specific. It's got a lot of steps to follow, so it, nobody's going to get in there and be like, I, this is too much for me. You can find Sally sifting through racks as a guest stylist at Arks Valley Village in Brooklyn Center. She's there once a month, helping people find the style she writes about in her book, one that's unique flattering and fits in your budget. Quality clothing can be found at every price point. Good design can be found at every price point. And paying attention to labels and prices really isn't necessary. You just need to go towards the aesthetic and the, the quality that you want in your life. The book is on Amazon.com and you can buy the paperback for $19.95. The Kindle version is $7.99. It's called Already Pretty. Good advice for anyone in there. <laughs> Coming up, why students were especially well behaved at Plymouth Middle School. But first in sports, a top five small school hoops matchup in Brooklyn Park. John Jacobson has your highlights up next. Welcome back. John joins us now with sports. And we're talking prep basketball, Maranatha. Yeah, a big matchup uh, Tuesday night. It was a packed house Tuesday in the tiny Maranatha Christian Academy gym. Boys basketball fans from Maranatha and Heritage Christian Academy were there to see a clash of two unbeaten Class A powers. It's number one Maranatha versus number three Heritage. This game lived up to its hype early. Zach Weld knocks down a three-pointer from the corner to give the Eagles an early 12-9 lead. Textbook fast break here for MCA. Isaiah Hansen, the outlet pass to Garrison the guard to his brother Grantham guard for the layup. 21-18 Mustangs. MCA gets into a zone offensively. Hansen starts to drive, then it's Grantham guard for a three-pointer, and Maranatha leads by eight. The Mustangs push the lead to double digits before halftime. Garrison guard drains a three as Maranatha leads 41-29 at the half. Early second half, and Spencer Bland with a nice drop step on the block for two points to bring the Eagles back to within five points. But MCA begins to pull away. Grantham Gillard to Isaiah Hansen for the hoop here. Mustangs lead 54-42. Garrison Gillard to Hansen for two more coming up. He scores 19 points in the night. Number one, Maranatha remains unbeaten with a convincing 78-54 win. Oh, this is a great team win. Um, came out focused. It's a big rivalry game, so take care of business. Uh, all glory to God. And those teams will play again February 15th at Heritage. Cooper's boys basketball team has played a tough schedule, and the Hawks have lost five games. But they are undefeated in North Suburban Conference play and look to knock off defending league champion Benilde St. Margaret's Tuesday. Steve Burton's Hawks on the road for this one. Benilde sees plenty of Cooper star Rashad Vaughn. He pops a three from the corner, the start of a big first half for Vaughn. There's pretty good defense for BSM on this one, but Vaughn hits anyway. 16 in the first half, 26 points on the night for him. And Vaughn sets up Marquise Gray for the layup as Cooper goes up 33-20. John Moore's Red Knights close the first half strong. Nick Burney with the buzzer beating three to bring Benilde within nine at 35-26. And when Alex Alexander scores inside early in the second half, but he'll say Margaret's is within seven. But Cooper reestablishes control from there. Brandon Robinson scores on the reverse layup and makes it 39-28. Robinson's put back as part of a 16-0 run for Cooper as they roll to a 71-50 win to move to 4-0 in conference games. The Manil and Cooper girls played a key game, and it's Cooper taking a 55-47 win on their home court. The Hawks are now 6-0 in North Suburban Conference play. Benil drops to 6-1. Also in girls basketball, Maple Grove hosting Anoka. Madison Ordner knocks the ball loose, tracks it down, and finds Mackenzie Barta for the hoop and foul for Maple Grove. 
But Anoka heats up. Abby Torgerson cans a three-pointer. Then Claire Lundberg gets a steal and a basket for a 20 to 15 Tornadoes lead. Lundberg leads the Tornadoes this night with 14 points. The Crimson with nice ball movement late in the first half leading to a Kayla Jones hoop. But Anoka leads 24-21 at the break. Maple Grove changes that in a hurry in the second half. Jones and then Kelly Oldenak hit back-to-back -back three pointers to put the Crimson in front. And that kick starts a 20-2 Maple Grove run. Julie Haggart gets in on the fun with a nice rebound and put back. Crimson go on to win 58-45 for their fifth straight win. Maple Grove's girls hockey team skated past Blaine 5-3 in late November. The rematch came Tuesday night on Maple Grove's home ice. Second period, Blaine Samantha Swanstrom picks off a pass, feeds Ashley Pafko in front, and that goal puts the Bengals up 3-0. But Maple Grove answers with two goals. Katie Josephson on the pass to Abby Larson. Right here for the shot and goal. That gets the Crimson on the board. It's 3-1. Just a couple of minutes later, the Bengals turn it over in their own end. Larson with a couple of nice moves here. Fires off another shot and another goal. And it's a 3-2 game after two periods. Third period, and Blaine goes back up by two goals. Kirsten Falk with a wrist shot that finds the back of the net. It's her 20th goal of the season, 4-2 Bengals. Larson helps Maple Grove cut into the lead once again. Josephson the shot, Larson the rebound. A hat trick for the sophomore, and it's 4-3 with just under 13 minutes to play. But Blaine gets two power play goals to close out the scoring, including this one on a 5-on-3. Swanstrom nets her second of the night, and Blaine beats Maple Grove 6-3. And that's a look at sports. All right, thanks a lot, John. We'll be right back. Administrators at Plymouth Middle School prove they are willing to do just about anything to reward good behavior. As a reward for good behavior, Assistant Principal Eric Norby danced rapper size popular Gangnam Style. Look at him go there. <laughs> the time between Thanksgiving and winter break is usually a tough one for students, but this incentive cut the number of behavioral infractions in half compared to last year. Students could watch the principal dance during lunch break, also randomly throughout the day when the song played over the intercom. It's about an incentive and about improving our behaviors in our building and our expectations. And that was part one, but the kids are having fun. They had fun with it. They're, they want me to dance more and they want the administrative team to dance a little more, but uh, that's not happening. A student had to teach Mr. Norby the moves, and as you can probably tell, he says this is very out of his comfort zone, but he was willing to do it as a reward for students. I don't know how you top that. <laughs> Good to motivate the kids. Sure. Yeah. That's all the news we have for today. Thanks for joining us, everybody.